four points are worth mentioning here. Point 1. The polarity between labor and nature ecology is one of the significant contradictions of capital. Labor, in its natural form, when considered outside the confines of capitalist social structures, is a manifestation of humanity's innate creative potential, a faculty that has evolved naturally but has been abstracted and profoundly alienated from its natural context by capitalism. In this book, we will argue that this dualism needs to be resolved at the normative level since the two, when unalienated, are not only ontologically entwined but must also restore their lost integration to allow a meaningful transition beyond capital. However, we do not suggest equating or hybridizing the two in our critical analyses of capital, as their effects on capitalist value are distinct. We will explore these effects in more detail later in chapters 5 and 6. Point 2. We need to differentiate between labor and creative power or the human's capacity to be creative beyond producing the necessary means of subsistence. Work is one of the socially natural forms of human's creative power that is reified into labor, and, thereby, commodity and value forms, made abstract and homogeneous, under the capitalist mode of production, as Marx's value theory entails. In this way, we also distance ourselves from productivist interpretations of Marx without marginalizing commodity production, see also Vitali, 2020. Point 3. Although we argue for closely relating the definition of true value to well-living, i.e., good life, consciously and conscientiously defined by the associations, communities of free commoners, Hosseini, 2018b, the proposition would still be crude as a practical approach if we consider achieving the communal good life as an ultimate goal, i.e., as an end in itself, while ignoring the necessity of what Marx terms as the transcendence of human self-estrangement, according to Marx et al. 1988, page 102, as well as what we may call, existential liberation, that is, exploring and living up to the purpose of existence. Point 4. Although we may occasionally, loosely, and interchangeably use terms like, organized life, life worlds, earth system, and, web of life, we are mindful of their specific disciplinary and theoretical connotations, which may limit their compatibilities with our critical social theory. Therefore, we introduce the concept of life domain as the interconnected system of all living things in their environment on planet Earth. Life domain encompasses the biosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere, and lithosphere and includes all forms of life, from microorganisms to plants and animals. The concept of life domain emphasizes the interconnectedness and interdependence of all living things and highlights the importance of maintaining the health and balance of the natural world for the well-being of, more than, human societies and future generations. The life domain includes human social systems and cultural practices that shape and are shaped by the living world. It is a holistic domain that encompasses all domains of life, including social, economic, and ecological dimensions of, more than human, life without ignoring their relative autonomy. The use of the word, domain is intended to imply both control and power relations but also responsibility and stewardship. The life domain, unlike the web of life and the like, is more inclusive of the sociology and anthropology of conflictual power relations. See end note 4. These four points will be incorporated into our arguments throughout the rest of the book. And so, we pose the question, what analysis of capital will we end up with if we base our theory on the relationship between a primarily normative notion of value, true value, and a primarily analytical one, fetish value, instead of merely relying on the latter? What implications would this have for both transformative theories of change and transformative and revolutionary praxis? By emphasizing the importance of a normative frame of reference, we can consider not only the economic but also the ethical and political dimensions of value production. This approach allows us to imagine alternative economic systems that prioritize social and environmental well-being over profit maximization. The focus shifts from a purely analytical understanding of capitalism as a social and economic system to a holistic approach that considers the social and ecological implications of different forms of value creation and exchange. This requires a nuanced understanding of how value is created and distributed and how it impacts different social groups in the environment. In terms of transformative and revolutionary praxis, the focus would shift from merely challenging existing power relations and economic structures of capitalism to creating alternative forms of value production and exchange that are based on normative principles of social justice and ecological sustainability. 
This involves a greater emphasis on the collective creation and distribution of value and a rethinking of traditional notions of ownership and property. Such an approach requires us to perceive capital as both the product and process of the perversion of the most indispensable types of commons vital for the creation of true value. Following an Aristotelian fourfold model of causality, i.e., the efficient, material, formal, and final causes, we consider four irreducible categories as the fundamental commons, that, only when, together cause true value. Category 1. Creativity is the efficient, commoning cause of true value, comprising, more than, humans' creative capacities to conscientiously achieve and sustain self-fulfilling levels of collective living in balanced coexistence with the rest of the life domain. Category 2. Livability is the material, commoning cause, consisting of the material and immaterial substances, components and inputs necessary for producing true value. These sources evolve naturally through self-sustaining, restorative, and regenerative practices under shared stewardship and collective decision-making across socio-ecological networks of communal life. Category 3. Conviviality is the formal, commoning cause entailing deep interdependence among, more than, human populations, pluriversality of their modes of living and caring and their communal solidarity inclusive of non-humans, or in other words, the convivial modes of, living well together, well living, buen vivir, through, and despite, frictions, tension, disputes, and diversities, and finally. Category 4. Alterity is the final, commoning cause of true value, such as organized prefigurative practices and subjectivities, imaginative, symbolic, proactivist, essential for transcending the dominant hierarchical structures and for actualizing rightful ideals, moralities, dreams, more than human liberation, purposeful, well-living, and a free life. Refer to the next chapter for further elaboration on these four essential causes of true value. As we will argue in the rest of the book, capital can be seen as fetish value in motion and operation, a form that is negative, both in function as a destructive force and in magnitude as it is a loss in true value necessary for the survival and self-fulfillment of organized life. This approach will avoid ambiguity caused by assigning the term, value, which inherently implies normativity, to, unfree, labor under capital. Labor in its natural, unreified, free, form is a social commons of the efficient type since the individual capacity for creativity and reproduction is a part and product of historically formed collective coexistences. Ignoring this reality results in confusing labor, under capital, abstract or concrete, with human creative power. Therefore, as we will discuss, for the abstraction of labor out of its commoning sources, that is, abstract labor is a reified social form of creative power susceptible to exploitation, capital has to disconnect, alienate labor from its ecological, communal, and political settings. In the capitalist mode of production, the rest of the fundamental commons are treated as preconditions for the production of fetish value, thus making labor deprived of its access to these now peripheralized or colonized commons. Recent theoretical advancements, especially those after the 2008 global financial crisis GFC, and the recent global pandemic, attempt to grasp the new natures and forms of capitalism in the new century. However, these efforts focus on capturing new qualities claimed to be the most distinctive relative to the past, such as, late, post-fordist, post-industrial, predatory, disaster, radical, surveillance, platform, and thus fail to provide a dynamic picture of capital's socio-historical totality and continuity based on an integrative value theory. Some recent radical theorists have re-articulated capitalist expansion and counter-expansion as a double movement of enclosure versus, commoning, a welcomed advancement, but still too ambiguous and metaphorical to overcome its consequent simplifications, see McCarthy, 2005, Hart and Negri, 2009, Sevilla Bitrago, 2015. Marxist theories of value focus on the internal workings of capitalist production relations and do not extend Marx's value theory to capitalism as a socio-ecological formation. Consequently, Many new theories of capitalism lack a coherent theory of value, despite frequently referencing the works of Marx and Engels, particularly Capital. Marx confirmed in the third volume of Capital that his work's scope and purpose are only a presentation of the inner organization of the capitalist mode of production, in its ideal average, see Marx, 2001, page 1113. Moreover, 
Marxian literature often fails to conceive capital's intermingling yet perverting relationships with non and post capitalist modes of living. Thus, there remains a wide chasm between the Marxian revivalist value theories and critical social theories of capitalism. A new path toward a more consolidated inquiry with profound praxeological implications is required. We aim to suggest a way of building such a path by providing a new analysis capturing the essence and complexities of capital in our era while attempting to overcome the above chasm in the literature and the inadequacies or limitations of a double movement, perspective, enclosure versus commoning. We begin by acknowledging that Marx took extraordinarily important steps toward theorizing capital from its classical political economy roots, and his general approach is outlined in capital functions as a useful paradigm. However, we argue that even neo-Marxian conceptions of capital remain captive to embedded capitalist mentalities propagated through critical modernist academic circles. Capital's nature is not solely processual but also modular, meaning it involves myriad interrelated social ecological processes rather than any single one, that is, accumulation via production, circulation, and distribution. Multiple theories provide essential, albeit partial, explanations for these multiple processes. However, the multi-systemic mechanisms through which these processes interact and interface, and their constantly evolving relative positions concerning one another, are what we call, the architecture of capital, have not been the subject of new integrative theorizations. We argue that such a new theorization opens a path to liberate us from the reductionist understanding of capital, and, capitalism, and their persisting conceptual residues. In Chapter 2, we identify four key limitations in traditional Marxian ideas of capital, given the current state of the capitalist world system and the various global crises we face. We also offer potential solutions to overcome these limitations. Each of these limitations has been detected and addressed by a different line of reflexive criticism in critical scholarship. However, interestingly, each one corresponds to an irreducible source of true value, or a fundamental commons, as introduced above. We aim to bring these critical reflections together through our proposed modular framework since all four ultimate sources of true value are closely intertwined, and their interactions require an integrative approach. This integrative approach, which we call the communist framework, is distinctive in the sense that it attempts to outline a new definition of capital, considering it as fetish value regime, which makes the development of a more coherent praxeology possible. In chapters 3 and 4, we expound on the architecture of capital, in the form of ideally constructed modules of inter, in, dependent social, infra, processes and meta, mechanisms. Capital is analytically deconstructed into its constituting processes, modules, and its evolution is discussed closely in association with alter and counter processes, and thus perceived more dynamically rather than as a fixed notion, a singular mode of social relations, or a singular process. Chapter 3 by taking a critical realist perspective, discusses the meta-theoretical basis of the model, preparing the ground for Chapter 4 to introduce the communist modular framework. Chapter 5 revisits and reconstructs Marxian value theory by drawing on the communist modular framework. We argue that labor is the result of the decommunization of more than human creative power through abstraction and appropriation processes. To clarify, Real abstraction, in the Marxian tradition refers to the process of extracting and reducing complex social relations to a simple measure of value, such as labor time. We will expand this notion by distinguishing between, primary, and, secondary, abstractions. Primary abstraction, creates labor and labor power outside capitalist production relations, while, secondary abstraction, results in abstract labor and productive capitalist value represented by exchange value and surplus value. By delineating the two types of real abstraction, we offer potential solutions to disagreements over the suitability of Marxian value theory in the context of post-industrial capitalism. Chapter 6, Drawing on the Communist Modular Framework, examines recent debates around the capacity of Marxian labor theory of value, or LTV, in adequately theorizing effective work, automation, and the ecological profile of capital. The chapter provides an overview of these major debates and discusses how the communist perception of value can help overcome some of the underlying confusion. Two important disclaimers are needed in this regard. Firstly, the book's use of the term, value theory, or, theory of value, 
should be interpreted as a preliminary discussion of a new approach to theorizing capital and counter-capital by re-centering value. The aim is not to present a fully sophisticated metaphysical argument or develop a theoretical framework for a specific empirical research project. Rather than aiming for conclusive arguments, this concise book, serving as the inaugural edition of the first volume in a series, functions as an open invitation to engage in a discussion of its ideas and further develop them into a comprehensive general theory that can be adapted into context-specific middle-range theories. As such, the arguments put forth are intended to be indicative rather than definitive. Secondly, the book does not call for a shift from a critical analytical approach to value to a purely normative one in critical scholarship. Rather, the new approach involves the incorporation of a normative notion of value, value is, what ought to be valued, or, what is naturally valued, in what we call the commonest state of living, into our analyses of reality, challenging the definition of value as set by capital. Without the analysis of what constitutes reality, normativity will be reduced to an imaginary utopia that may, at best, function as a source of motivation. This resembles what capital makes us believe, that our dreams are only dreams. But the normative is the product of constant dialogue between our dreams and experiences of both injustices and of our realized virtues in the past and present. Surely the normative is always distorted by the value systems manufactured to sustain the status quo. But it is the social experiences of, and reflections on, such value systems that fuel the evolution of the normative. Value systems decide what value is on the ground, for instance, is it material wealth, economic productivity, communal well-being, or spiritual growth. It is the relentless struggles over and negotiations around making, circulating, and taking, value, that, in, re, turn, determine changes in value systems. The proposed new, normative analytical, value theory, i.e., a normative analytical approach to theorization, has the power to liberate our analyses and middle-range theories of capitalist relations from the notional influence of capitalist value by identifying four essential commoning causes of true value. By introducing the concept of true value, the normative element of the theory becomes explicit. The theory reconceptualizes capitalist value as fetish value. This form of value is characterized as negative, because it serves as a destructive force and represents a loss in true value, rather than being a virtue or a purely analytical construct like exchange value, which carries implicit normative implications. We need to emphasize here that the normative is not baseless in reality, and the analytical is not delusion-free. True value and fetish value do not belong to two essentially different universes, one being the world of ideals and the other being the world of the real. Fetish value is a perverted and distorted version of true value. The fact that true value is not fully actualized does not make it unrealistic and the fact that fetish value is actualized under capital does not make it a reflection of true reality. Notes on Chapter 1 Note 1. This chapter draws on material from the paper titled Capital as Fetish Value Has No True Value by Hosseini, 2022. Note 2. Both classical bourgeois political economy and the Marxian value theory presume this definition. Note 3. According to Harvey, 2018b, pages 76 to 77, technical glitches and delays in the circulation of capital give rise to an anti-value that transforms into political resistance against commodification and privatization, thus creating an active space for anti-capitalist struggle. Harvey also claims that the working class, however defined, represents the embodiment of anti-value. Note 4. By including the social and economic systems, as well as the idea of power and resource distribution, the definition acknowledges the role of class conflict and other social inequalities in shaping the relationship between humans and the natural world. Additionally, one could emphasize the importance of social and environmental justice in any discussion of the life domain to further highlight the need to address issues of inequality and exploitation in our relationship with the rest of nature. Chapter 2. Beyond Capital away from Marx with Marx. We have so far argued for a transformative approach to understanding capital as a value regime that not only creates, circulates, and distributes value, often in a conflictual fashion, but fundamentally defines it as a normative quality to be placed primarily as the final cause of major human activities. See Endote 1. As we will discuss in this chapter, 
Classical and Marxian value-based theories of capital have traditionally focused on the former aspect of capital's value regime, taking a critical analytical stance. However, in recent decades, intellectual and social struggles have shifted toward disputing what should be valued under or beyond the system, and calls for restructuring or replacing the value regime of capital have gained momentum.